Welcome in, race fans. December 26th, day after Christmas. Uh, if I sound a little stuffy, it's because I have a somewhat of a cold. I'm trying to get over this cold. Whew, I'm about presents and, and princesses out. My little girl's got everything Disney creates that's pink and has princesses on it. I'd like to welcome back to the program tonight after serving a one game suspension. I oh, heck with it. Let me just let me just play his theme song. And that's a fact, Jack. <laughs> Brian Gray, what's going what's on? Up, Will? I was being envious of last week, just slightly. <laughs> well, we uh, everybody has to go visit the penalty box every once in a while. I'm finding myself a lot in the penalty box lately. Well, like don't, I'm all penalty boxed out. I got you. Well, uh, if you're married then you're always in the penalty box. So I'm married. Brandy keeps me uh, total line most times. Um, mm-hmm. But, so you had a week off, and leading up to, so how was Christmas? Christmas was, uh, it was pretty good. I had a little, few hiccups here and there. I had to call and chew some people out Saturday night, but it's all fixed now. So other than that, hanging up with the family was good, and, uh, I can't really ask for much more. We, you know, it was uh, surprisingly not as violent as I was expecting. <laughs> so, you guys are used to a little bit of a, a battle royale out Christmas, I guess. Nah, just a little bit. We had a little bit of a reunion between my between myself and and my uh, uncle. He he still hates me though, but he uh, he was there. Well, that's what families. Uh, you're gonna love your family or hate your family as much as you love them. I reckon. Yeah. Families little, that fight together stay together. That's right. It's the glue. It's the it's the glue that keeps all all, uh, all of it together. Yeah. Now, Miss my my little Miss Miss Emmy, she uh, made out like an absolute bandit. Our Walmart threw up into our living room. Um, <laughs> she got a uh, listen. She got she got an Xbox. She's five. I, I'm five thirty-eight. Five years old. Five years old. Yeah, gets, gets an Xbox. I'm 38, been waiting for an Xbox for a number of years. This this little turd here walks at her for five years, and now she's kicking an Xbox. Um, but that's her. I'm way better at at the dance game than she is. I've been I've been schooling her um, on the dancing game. Some of the hip hop music, the hip the hippity hip hop music that you. I can't hardly play any of those new video games. I haven't played game in so long. You sit down with those with those kids, and it's like, what does this button do and that button? There's just too many buttons on that controller. Yeah, remember Atari? A joystick. You, had a, you had one button. You move your guy around, you hit one button. Now you got to pull this trigger, hit this button, move this joystick over here, and then toggle this other one and clap your hands and pinch your butt together real hard and spit on it. Man, what hell games are you playing, dude? <laughs> anyway, you're right, though. It, it is a combination. <laughs> that sounds like a fatality from... Uh, the fighting games from the dude. I just got me some uh, California Pizza Kitchen delivered to me. Wait, and is that a pizza? Good. I don't have no idea, but it looks good. I'm gonna be sitting here eating while you're talking. So go ahead, Whip. All right. <clears throat> well, t- we're gonna welcome to the program tonight, uh, Mr. Mooningham of the uh, Dirt Series. The excuse me, the Mars Dirt Racing Series. Uh, he's gonna come on talk about his series there in the Midwest. Uh, just the Dirt gonna- Series, huh? Well, it's the Mars Dirt Racing Series. Okay. We're also going to bring on uh, Jason Atkins of flag to flag dot net, and he'll be bringing with him uh, some of the guys from the Carolinas uh, to talk racing that out that way. Um, now you you have you got a new car coming up, don't you? That's a secret, man. Oh, okay. I didn't know it was a secret. You tell I'm me not- it was a secret. See, now I can't lie to you. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought you said you was building a car. I did, but I didn't tell you on the radio. 
Oh, well, that's my bad. Now, now look, now everybody's going to be secretly watching for me now, right? <laughs> no, not my bad. Now I can't, I, I'm not going to have any of those excuses last year I was driving some old beat up race car. Well, this year though, this year is a, uh, is a new year, and you're you're you you're out for the the checkered flag. Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. Be uh this will be officially, I guess, my uh, well, my second. It'll be my second really full season. I haven't, you know, I've been driving the the late models for about four years, but this was, last year was really the first year that we ran a lot of races. You know, it was the first time I was able to even afford to go that as much as we did. So. Um, I think we're real close, and uh, it, we'll we'll get a win this year. There's no doubt in my mind. I I definitely think we're gonna get some features. Well, what I was doing was tricking you. I had to get to my notes. Uh, Jason Atkins is going to be bringing David Smith on from Inman, South Carolina. He uh, finished second in the fast track southeast uh, touring points, uh, and he third in the weekly points. Also, Ryan Atkins from Mount Airy, North Carolina. Uh, he mm-hmm. won the spring spring thaw crate late model event there at Volunteer, the high banks of Volunteer Speedway. And I did announce earlier that Steve Hendren of Hendren Racing Engines was going to be on. We've had a uh, a, a last minute change. We're actually going to talk to one Mister uh, to Mister Andrew Wiley. Uh, he's an up and coming driver who races crate late models there in the Carolinas. Uh, hails from Pennsylvania but lives in the Carolinas. He'll be on with us. Um, but we're going to take a small break. And as soon as we get back, we'll be talking to Mr. Mooningham of the Mars Racing Series. So after the break, we'll be talking to Mr. Mooningham. Now I'm going to kill this pizza. Kill it. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody back. Mr. Gray, you with us? Welcome back, Webb. <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> now, you guys were making fun of my commercials last week, weren't you? No, I... Actually, Mr. Stapleton asked me if that was you, and I said, "Now, I w- now don't now see. I'm not, I, I'm not supposed to be uh, letting my word, his name, come out of my uh, mouth." <laughs> I had to think about what I was going to say there for a second. <laughs> I didn't make fun. He said, "Was that you?" And I said, was, "I wasn't." <clears throat> hey, I tried, man. No, you did a great job. I thought you did a wonderful job. I thought I did too. I think it was great. I, and I loved at it. first, at first, I didn't know it was you. And I can carry a tune. That's right. I Heck, I need a I need a bucket when I carry one. Ah, uh, no, you don't. So you got this little thing here from Digitech called the Vocalist Live. That's all you need. Well, all right. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome Mr. Mooningham of the Mars Racing Series to In the Dirt, sir. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing good, sir. How are you? We are uh, recovering from Christmas. Our our pocketbooks are lighter and our bellies are fuller. That's what they say around well, my house anyway. Well, that's certainly true up here in Missouri where I'm from. But, uh, you know, we had great weather for the holidays, and it's a good Christmas, so I cannot complain. Yeah, it's amazing that it, we didn't get any snow, so the kids were wondering, well, how does Santa Claus get here when there's not any snow? How do you explain that one? Yeah. Well, he, he's pretty magical, you know. He, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he can get her done. Well, Mr. Mooningham, uh, Mr. Ham, we spoke earlier on the telephone and uh, told you that I, we originate the show out of Alabama. Brian Gray is my co-host this evening. He is out of Cincinnati. Um, you're located there in Missouri. Talk, talk to us as if we're new to the area and new to Mars racing. Um, when it came about, uh, who brought it about, and how long you guys have been around? Well, actually, the the series started in the year 2000. Uh, we've had 11 seasons. Uh, the original founder of the Mars series was a uh, Mooney Star, who for most of the uh, dirt track in Batesville, Arkansas, and and uh, it's kind of been around the Midwest here, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, and, and these states down here. And uh, and now I've had it. This will be my fourth season. We're certainly, you know, we're excited about our upcoming schedule and. Uh, uh, you know, we've had some big time drivers run it, and, and we're looking for the same this year. But what kind of radius do you guys run out of? I mean, you're based there in, in Missouri, so how about about how far outside of where your uh, home base is do you go? 
Well, we actually go a long ways. Our, our home base is actually the Monet Speedway, Monet, Missouri, which is, we're pretty close to, the, in southwest Missouri, we're pretty close to Springfield. And gosh, we go as far southeast as Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, we go to the St. Louis area. We go up to uh, Tri-City Speedway. That's Kevin Gundek track here at Granite City. We go to uh, the I-55 Raceway, Raceway in St. Louis. Of course, that's Kenny Schrader's track. And uh, we go down to... Uh, uh, Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, as far as going north, we go into uh, the Kaziski track at I-80 up at the, in Nebraska. Uh, we go west, uh, Jetmore, Kansas. We have a 12,000 to win race out there, and Jetmore's out in the Dodge City area. Muskogee, Oklahoma. So, you know, we cover we cover Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri. Uh, we go to Iowa. We go to Nebraska. Go to Illinois. Uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, so seven or eight states, so covered a pretty wide area. Last year we had That's quite a bunch on the schedule. Yeah, we travel a lot. We really do. We travel a lot. So do you guys, most of the guys that run on the series, I mean, is it really based off of uh, pretty much the local draw, or do you got a, a, a group of guys that follow you pretty much everywhere you go? Well, uh, going back to the history of the series, you know, uh, the first uh, – first 10 years we had only two champions and one of them was Bill Fry out of Greenbrier, Arkansas and the other was Terry Phillips out of Springfield, Missouri uh, and then in year 11 uh, Phillips broke the tie and he had six championships and, and Fry had uh, five and then next year we had a new man on the block out of Republic, Missouri Brad Looney, uh, Looney drives a Moyer race car and had fuel racing engines and uh, he was the champion this year so uh Brad will come back next year and try to defend that title, but you know, I, I guess I'm going the long way around to answer that question. We we generally have ten to twelve guys follow us regular, and then of course you know we we depend on local cars like any other series when we get to an area. One thing that really helps us, we feel, we're UMP sanctioned, and so that lets us in the tracks like uh, you know St. Louis area and and Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, you get in the UMP country, there's a lot of late models and a lot of good late models. Right. So is this a pretty much a, an open, like, super, what they would call a super late? I think there should only be one, yeah. one ser- you know, not saying a series, but there should only be one type of late model. And, they, you know, they they have so many. you got uh, limited late right. models and crates and supers and this this guy and that. Um, so is this a pretty much a, what you would call a super late model series? It is. This is a super late model series. We've, I mean, we've had uh, about two of our races this year was won by Billy Moyer, and, and you know Moyer's one of the top top five in the whole country. Uh, uh, we get Shannon Babb a few times. Uh, you know, besides Phillips, Terry Phillips has been a big time racer for a long time. He runs with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we are. We're a super late model race. We like to sanction UMP in the region. That's a universal set of rules, and we don't have to worry about. You know, I mean, not that we won't adjust the rule a little bit to get into a track, but, um, you know, Moments UMP track here in Missouri and and, uh, and then the, all the tracks east of us are. So, it, number one, it's better for the drivers. And not only can they run for our points, fun, they also get UMP points. But it's just better for the series to have a universal set of rules. Right. So, you, you guys have been around uh, 11 years now, uh, 12 years. Yes. Um, the last few years, what has the economy done to uh, your brand of uh, late model racing? You know, our numbers are pretty good. We, I think we averaged 33 cars in the event last year, which uh, that's not bad. Our high was, uh, I think we had 51 or two cars in the spring at Clarkfield, Tennessee. Uh, had a couple of races. We were around, you know, we started 22 cars on most events, and, and that was our low number, but our average is low in the 30s, and, and we feel like that's pretty good. And, and our grandstand at most of our events is really good. Uh, I know I run a weekly show here at Monette, and, and and my problem right now with, with my weekly show track is is car count. And so my numbers are actually down on my weekly show, but my my numbers are actually better on special events. So as a so you're you're also a track promoter. Right? Um, that's what I under, understood you just to say. What is uh... What does a track owner have to do uh, as a weekly track owner and a uh, weekly show? What's he have to do to uh, get the fans in the seats these days? 
Well, it's tough. I mean, it really, really is. And uh, I just came from a workshop out in Reno, Nevada, and, and a lot of ideas are, you know, exchanged. And, and hopefully you can take some of those with you. But, uh, it is a tough deal. And, and uh, you know, my track it here at home, we only charge $10 in the grandstand. We let we let kids 11 and under in free. And, and uh, still sometimes we struggle on a weekly show. So, I think we're going to, as promoters, we're going to have to mix it up a little bit and put a little variety in a weekly show. And, and the reason I feel that way is because when I bring a Mars show or USMTS Modifieds or a Sprint Car show to town once or twice a year, my attendance appears to be uh, pretty good, even though it costs more to get in and see them. So, so I, I feel like I need to just, you know, put, yeah, I, I've got to juice up the weekly show somehow and make, make it a little more appealing. Now, I, like I said, I'm from Indianapolis, so I'm my old man uh, come up from Florida and come to Alabama, and we went to a dirt track, and he's an asp- old asphalt guy, and he was uh, just confused, at, like Brian said earlier, about which car was which and motor this and that and the other. Um, it, is the Are the shows just not as exciting as they were, say, in the 70s and the 80s? Um, is it too watered down? Is it... Um, I mean, is, is there something we can do on the track as far as the show that's on the track and prove it to put butts in the seats? I mean, what's the what's the r- workshop telling you? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of everywhere. You know, I, I feel like our series is, is pretty spicy, and, and we have a you know wide range of drivers, and, and, and we have uh, you know. Uh, uh, I'm not worried about it, even though I charge 20 bucks to see a Mars and only 10 to see a weekly show. They, the, the spectators seem to want to watch the special events, and, and so somehow I, I don't know the answer, but we have got to make a weekly show almost seem like a special event. That's right. Well, Mr. Mooneyham, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I told mm-hmm. you I wouldn't keep you much longer than 10 minutes. Uh, when does your season kick off there in the Mars uh, Dirt Car Series? Actually, we start March 2nd and 3rd in Clarksville, Tennessee, and uh, uh, first night's 3,000 wins, second night's 5. We have uh, our biggest race of the year is April 28th at Jetmore, Kansas, and it's a 12,000 win event, so we're excited about that. And a lot of 5,000 win shows and, and some three and 4,000 shows uh, sprinkled in there, and, and then our champions in the year, depending on how many events we'll get in stuff. And with consistencies, generally ends up twelve to fifteen thousand bucks in their pocket. So we got a good schedule. We're looking forward to it. You can find it on MarsRacingSeries.com. That's MarsRacingSeries.com. Our our ten new schedules up there. And uh, wow, certainly glad you guys called us, and we're we're tickled death to be on the show. Well, I'd like to, once the season kicks off, I'd like to call on you again, and we'll 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 be a sounding board for you guys in the Mars series if you agree to that. Oh, absolutely. You give us plenty of time, and, and we'll be on your show. And if you're ever in, in my area at one of my events, or you give me a call, and we'll take care of you. All right. Well, that's Mr. Mooningham of the Mars Dirt Car Series out of Missouri. they got a pretty wide footprint. Again, you can find him at MarsRacingSeries.com. When we come back, we will bring on Jason Atkins from flag to flagnet and uh, we'll finish up the show with all things flag to flagnet and uh, guys from the Carolinas. Back. Welcome back, race fans, to In the Dirt. Uh, accidentally uh, disconnected my co host. You killed me. <laughs> you I was demoted off the air again. <laughs> he didn't even do nothing. I did, well, I was about to do something. I don't know. There's a <laughs> lot of people up this way got mixed opinions about UMP, but I, I don't even know how I feel about it. Well, right now we're going to welcome. Oh, before I, uh, Jason, you with us? Jason Atkins, flag to flag dot net. Yes, sir. I'm here. There, there he is. Uh, How's real- it going, Jason? Good, doing well. A little bit under the weather, but uh, we're, we're hanging in there pretty good. Well, real quick, before we get started with Jason Atkins, I'd like to announce to everybody that uh, Michael Rigsby is go- is going to um, let me give away one night, which is the first evening of the pay per view. So, any of my listeners. Or any of the people in the chat room. So the tenth rant. caller. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, I w- yeah, okay, let's do that. Oh, let's, 
That was just, you know, that's what they generally do on the radio. So just, let's do that. Let's uh, the uh, the tenth caller to the program, and I've got a guy. I mu- it must be our next guest. Uh, uh, you got David Smith coming on first, Jason. Yes, uh, David Smith will be joining us in a few minutes. Okay, well, let's do this to give this night of racing away. The the tenth caller at seven at, at seven uh, at eight Eastern or seven Central. The tenth caller at eight Eastern, Eastern or seven Central will win the the first night of the pay per view from uh, Arizona. So the next twenty five thirty minutes, get ready to call in and we'll uh, we'll award this thing out and uh, get your information and get to Michael Rigsby at Dirt on Dirt and you'll have at least one night of the uh, pay per view. So you're gonna answer the phone, say you're caller number one, caller Click. number two. Click. Click. Yeah, because they hang up immediately. Like yeah, number one click. It. Yeah, we're gonna do it just like the uh, the radio stations. Now, all right. Jason Atkins, how are you, sir? Other than the cold. Other than the cold, uh, doing well. Uh, doing well. Safe and happy holiday season and uh, belated Christmas wishes and holiday wishes to everyone out there listening. Well, yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I I'm wishing that it all just. Uh, all the paper and all the, uh, the uh, my, my living room is trash right now with toys. Um, I like for it to get picked up sometime. Emmy, you listening? You out there listening on the radio? Yeah, but Webb, you ain't worrying about those toys being scattered all over your room right now. Uh, you guys are not hers; they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jason. Uh, so, fly to fly dot net. It's the uh, it's the newest and and, and greatest way to uh, to keep drivers and and uh, companies. Uh, uh, informed of what's going on in the community, how things going with it since we talked a month ago. Uh, but things are starting to, to develop a lot more, uh, of course, since uh, you know, now that we're five to six weeks into our project. Uh, I would definitely agree it's the newest, uh, and I hope that one day will be the greatest. But you know, we we know we have a uh, a long road ahead of us in, in debuting a new product, and one of the challenges for us, Webb, has has been the fact that our product is is really. Not only new, but it's it, it's a it, it's unique in its own way. It's not the the same product that you normally see in the in the communications aspect of, of motorsports marketing. And what we have have tried to do is is kind of overcome some of the growing pains we've had in just getting people to you know identify with our concept. And, and while we believe it's a a solid concept, it's still you know familiarizing um, our clientele with exactly what we're about. And creating that brand awareness, and, and now that is, in the last couple of weeks, we start, started to see that kind of, kind of take root and, and and gain momentum, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next two or three months to see how that how that gains momentum for us going into the uh, 2012 season. And part of what we're doing too um, is a kind of a co-op thing. Is um, we're going to be bringing some of the guys in uh, who you work with to in the dirt, um, and tonight you got a pretty good. Pretty good round, uh, round of guys for us. Who we got coming up first? Uh, we have three guys tonight. We'll have uh, David Smith out of Inman, South Carolina, and, and David's been a not only a, a longtime friend, but, uh, but a very influential uh, part of flag to flag and the development of it from the drivers' aspect side. And David's um, a veteran, longtime racer uh, on asphalt and on dirt as well. And his his accomplishments are are renowned here in the southeast and and on the East Coast, and we'll follow David up with uh, Ryan Atkins out of Manory, North Carolina, who also competes in the Pro Late Model Division, and then we'll conclude with Andrew Wiley uh, from Salzburg, Pennsylvania, who uh, is a former asphalt racer, now into uh, the dirt racing, and is now branding his own uh, chassis. Oh, so he's good. Okay. Wow. Uh, so there's, a, there's another new uh, Link model, Webb. There's a there's a bunch of a new the late pro, model right now. The pro late model division now. The pro late model division. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of the a lot of the guys, you know, the, the, the crate, it's it's still the crate division, but I think it's a lot of you know how it's viewed. Sometimes you go to some places and they're referred to as pro late models, and and some are referred to as, as crate late models. I guess kind of like limited late model versus steel head late model or super late model versus open late model, but um, right. See, that's what I was. That's what I've been trying to. To, that's just my point of view. I don't think it's just mine. I think a lot of people feel the same way, is that there's too many daggone late model divisions. There needs to be one, and and that's it. 
and and I know about I, I understand the money situation with this and that, but at the same time on on the short tracks, you know, there's guys around oh uh, like uh well who who can I think of right off the top of my head would be uh like Freddie Carpenter up here. Runs a uses a crate late model, runs on the short tracks on the short tracks. He's he's just as fast as anybody else that would come in there from a touring series. So that I think it's starting to get a little bit out of hand with, you know, this late model and that late model, and it's it's just it's just getting too far out of hand. Well, with somebody that, needs to do something to figure it out. Well, with that, let's welcome David to the program. Yes, sir. I got you. Um, uh, Brian's brought up the uh, you 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 run the crates, you run the um, fast track uh, touring series, fast track weekly stuff. Um, what has the crate car or the pro dirt late model or whatever you want to call it? What has it done for your racing? Uh, does it make it more affordable, like it's supposed to? Oh, yeah, it's just kept me involved in racing. You know, three or four years ago, I own my own business, so three or four years ago when things started getting bad in the economy, you know, you can't just keep on paying thirty five, forty thousand dollars for open motors and uh the trouble that you build that you when you try to get as much you can get out of, of course you don't have the dependability and it's ten thousand dollars every time you freshen them up. Well just to freshen up you can buy two crate motors for what it costs. And I'm not knocking super race and I still drive for other people and I still enjoy. But it's not really practical for a small guy to try to fund it on his own anymore. When the crate races or pro late mall races are paying as, as good as they're paying right now, and the, and the point money that Fast Track has put up <coughs> over the last four or five years that you can race for, it's yeah. just really not. Uh, you know, I understand the other guys saying too. You know, well, about see, it's, that, it's kind of, that's kind of the big thing down in the south, though, is crate cars have have really taken off good down there. But but like up here in this part of the country, I, I know that there's a couple tracks over in Indiana or whatever that run crate crate late model cars. And I'm not knocking anything to do with crate late models. It's, it's just I think that the the division of it's like we keep breaking the we keep breaking the car classes up, and you go to a racetrack and and people are concerned about this car or that car, and and as far as the you know the money thing goes, I think a lot of it has to do with the desire of a of a guy to want to go racing. You know, 20 years ago. You had guys that really, really wanted to, that really wanted to race that didn't have a lot of money, so they figured out how to do it. They went out, they did well, and as time went on, I think there's a lot more people out there that just really don't have that drive and that real deep desire to even want to do it. They want to be able to go into a store and, and buy something and go to a racetrack and expect to win with it. That's just where I'm coming from. Well, that's just where competition's got to be what it is. It's not just, you know, racers competing against one another. It's racetracks competing against one another. It's series competing against one another. And now you've got Earnhardt Childers and, and some of those guys and Ralph Shakes has come in. It's, this really drove the price of motors up. It's not right, but do you really think that most guys that are out there racing, racing are tearing them. whether the motor's <laughs> built by Cornette or Ralph Yates or any anybody else? Yeah, when well, they make fifty or seventy-five horsepower, yeah, they. they, they but see, through. I've never seen Ralph Yates come out and just dominate. Besides being, you know, in a Bloomquist car when Bloomquist is running, but on the Lucas series, that's that's a totally different deal. But I know guys up here that got Ralph Yates and Jay Dickens motors that can't beat Joe Blow down the street steel block motor. Well, I mean, that, you know, some, you know, it's, I mean, it's all got to do. You can't knock anybody. I mean, so much got to do with talent. You know, I mean, there's yeah. some people in racing for 20 freaking years that want to race. You don't knock that guy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're out there yeah. doing it, spending yeah. the money, and you know, I want to race too. And there's a place for everybody. That's kind of why this crates come in. You know, and, and it did get started as a, you know, some of the guys that that couldn't afford to go super race, and then come some of us that got tired of spending the money, you know, decided to go back and run it where it'd be more affordable and more fun. I mean, I now I'm not. You know, I mean, I, I, you hate to lose a motor, but it's not the end of the world now if you go and you don't cry all the way home. <coughs> you yeah, it, motor versus about, if you versus go blow up a, a thirty, bucks. you go blow up a thirty thousand dollar motor. That's a little hard on your heart on the on the ride back home. I, I yeah, guess so I get that. that. Now, and you're coming out of road right right the, now. I'm just talking about having the desire and the drive. Road. I think it's 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 moved a uh, it's moved a class of racers out to the to the sideline. Now, Dave, yeah. we, we can we can talk about uh, the crate versus super all night. 
Oh yeah, there's all kind of. And, and, I, and listen, I, I really like the fact that we can we can we can debate things here. Um, that's part of what this thing is is a, a public forum to let people. Uh, but I brought you on as a guest. I want to hear about uh, David Smith, High Bridge Auto, and 2012 race. What what we got going on with you in, in, in the next few months? Well, I sent the car to TNT this past week, and they went ahead and put it in the jig and uh, checked everything over and put a new body on it. And plus, they're finishing up a, a, a gonna, actually going to start on a new car for me here in a couple of weeks. And uh, to get ready, I guess what you I haven't seen a, the schedule hadn't been released from Fast Track yet, but I'm, I'm planning on running the Fast Track series again this year. And I think we'll probably get started up about March, and uh, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. You know, and Jason's put this new deal together and able to contact a lot of our sponsors, and this and it's going to be a big follow-up for us after the races. Uh, it, it'll help me be able to, to say thanks a lot quicker, a lot sooner, and, you know, keep me more in contact with the sponsor where they know kind of where we're going to be racing at and what's going to be going on. And personally, I've never had a website yet, and I need, and I need to do that, you know, Business wise, which I got one business wise, but for racing, and um, I've been doing it like 25 years. It's time, I guess, to catch up, get in the swing of things. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's right. Um, now, Stan Lester's made some announcements here in the last few months about uh, TV coverage. Uh, have you been able to talk to your sponsors and let them know that that's something that's going to be um, uh, potentially happening with the Fast Track Series and how it may involve them? Yeah, and I think that's going to be a plus, you know, for 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 definitely for the crate race and fast track pro late models, uh, for his series. Uh, he hadn't really announced a date. I know there's been quite a bit of talk about Charlotte. That'd be a, a real big plus for us if we could go there. I think it's pretty much set up to handle the TV and the big crowds. And you know, it, it'll his end of the year racing has not really been what he wanted it to be. The money's been there, but you just don't get the um, competition the uh, competitors to come like he's been looking for in the past. So I'm, I'm thinking that he's going to be able to help step, you know, his program up. It'll be a big benefit for us as racers go, sponsors go, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. You know, and he's added a lot more races throughout the season. This, I think he's got a real, I think he told me like 20-something races already on the touring schedule. And I think he changed his weekly program around some. So he's kind of revamping everything for this coming season. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. And I think everything's in a positive way. So I'm looking forward to it. Now, with the uh, with the te- with the television um, comes a, a different form of uh, advertising. Um, you you guys can get the drivers of the Fast Track Series should be able to get their um, potentially get their sponsors' names out to them. I don't know a few million people. I'd imagine, Jason. You know the numbers on that? No, you, you, I'm, you know, I'm David. Sure. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. David's been you've been telling your sponsors about the T V thing. What's been the response back from them? It's been all right. It's, it's been positive, you know, and then Stan's also offering a package where they can sponsor on the show, uh, on the T V program for pretty reasonable money. I know this, I haven't got all the details there, but he's right, gonna have that's, affordable that's work. for the series. What I'm talking about is you no, 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 as a so as a driver. Too. Has it been? Has it made it easier to approach guys? I mean, have they have they welcomed you more? Say, have they been a little bit uh, easier to approach and try to get a little bit more money out of? I haven't got everything all finalized for this coming year, as far as that goes. But everybody that I've seen to talk to in the past, you know, you really—that's what they were saying. They'd like to have some more coverage. We'll kind of travel it off. So when I brought this TV package to the, the two main ones that helped me, matter of fact, I've got a, a new guy that's come on this year that's going to help me. Which I mean, we've been friends and for a long time, but it, it's going to be a real big plus for um, you know me being an area. And, and if it ends up being Charlotte close, I mean, I've got a lot of companies that I work with through my business, and I think it'll—I think it'll definitely help. Uh, obtain a bigger sponsor for this particular race. And But what I was saying is we can also take and help with selling um, a, a commercial also during a race to get a more exposure at a reasonable rate also is what I was getting at. So do, do you get like a, any compensation from the series for bringing a sponsor to that? <laughs> I haven't spoke with Sam, but I've really been kind of busy this last month trying to... Uh, That's get, what I'm concerned yeah. about. I'm more <laughs> concerned about, you know, making sure that my racing program goes. Because the series are going to are going to find their ways to do their thing. So I, I'm just more concerned about are the are the potential sponsors more interested in putting their money on you, so to speak, just because there's television coverage now. That that was my whole point. Yeah, from the ones I've spoken with yesterday, and uh, it seemed like they're going to get more involved uh, as far as bringing their, uh, their employees to the race. Uh, 
get you know making a real big deal out of it. So I mean, they seem to be getting more involved since it's going to get it's going to be a bigger you know event. You know, plus maybe become an annual event. Yeah. So it, it seems it seems to have got their attention more than just a regular Saturday night show somewhere. You know what I'm saying? That's good. Well, David, I certainly like to uh, tell you thank, thank you for coming on the show and spending a little bit of time away from the family this holiday weekend. Um, hope all, all everything Christmas went good for y'all. Uh, matter of fact, well, you're missing th- a big opportunity. I'm fixing to tell him. Uh, <laughs> go, go ahead and thank your uh, sponsors uh, for the 2011 season. Well, I've got a, a good many products, special like like uh, Jason said, we mentioned. I've been doing it for a long time, and and I've got a list of people there. I don't I don't have it in front of me, but I know uh, Pro Shocks has been a supporter of mine for over 20 years, and BP Racing Fuel. Uh, FK Rod Ends has come on in the last couple of seasons, and, and Maria's been a, a real big asset to my program this past it's couple of years. Nice. And, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's tonight, too, I think, with Atlanta. But um, my own company, I mean, I've backed my own racing, you know, for the last 14 or 15 years, kind of in the family operation. My granddad owned racetracks for 50 years, so. Um, McCarter Towing's come on this year, matter of fact, and pretty much has taken over my racing stuff and putting the, helping put this new car and all together, so. Um, He's the guy that does a lot of my towing for my company, so it's uh it's all looking good for 2012. I'm excited about it. Like I said, we had a real good Christmas, a lot of family time, and uh, we're fixing to go skiing this coming weekend, and and just try to try to enjoy the off season before it gets real hectic again, and uh, and gets back going. You know, when I race, when if there's a race, I don't think they can have one without me, so I got to go about every weekend somewhere. You know. That's right. So you well, did you you used to run on on pavement, right? Um. I started, uh, well, I dirt raced, I started like in 87, and then I went pavement racing in 89 and run up through 98, and uh, well, I run some of the Craftsman Truck Series races when it first got started, and then I won a race in the, at Charlotte Motor Speed when that old um, NASCAR Sportsman Series that they had for three or four years, and then plus I run quite a bit of All-Pro, which is the K&N, excuse me, K&N East Series now. And then I switched. Once I bought my business in '98, I switched back to dirt racing because it's it's just closer and it's more affordable. And I'd already got old and and figured I wasn't oh, gonna make come it on NASCAR. Now. <laughs> Tell all them asphalt guys what what's for getting to the racetrack. Man, no doubt about it. It's not near the fun. I mean, I enjoyed it. I had some good times playing racing and, and met a lot of great people and and uh, had a lot of great sponsors and supporters, you know, through that to make it all happen. But, uh, you know, dirt sports all that, and, and it's, it's a lot more fun, and it's a lot more enjoyable. The racing's better. The people are better. It's just, just what I'm hooked on. I just had, that's the that's the big opportunity I was getting at with. Okay. You're going to miss out on that. Well, Dave, uh, we're going to keep track of you over the course of the next season, and I uh, hope to have you on a few more times in 2012. How about that? Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Happy Davis. New Year. Happy New Year, sir. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. When we come back on In the Dirt, we're going to move on to Ryan Atkins. Ryan Atkins. Man, this uh, hour is getting away from us, Ryan. It's flying. I... <laughs> Are we back on the air? We're back on the air. Oh, wow. We're back on the air? Uh, yeah, we we were talking all over each other. It, it it just uh you, some shows is it's uniformed. I think what it is is that there's kind of like a little bit of a delay. That might be. It might be. So I just keep talking, and and David <laughs> just kept talking. We were just talking all over top of each other. And, and Jason, we certainly apologize that uh, if we spoke over Jason, it wasn't. Uh, there's not a delay on my end, but I don't know about your guys, and there may be a, a little bit of a delay. No, nah, well, we're good, guys. We're good. Well, I want to welcome now uh, Ryan Atkins. You with us? Yes, sir. I'm here. Driver out of Mount Airy, North Carolina. Uh, hey, there's a there's a same, same last name here. Uh, we we're related, right? With the with Jason. No relation. No, re- no I'm relation. Just we're brothers. Okay. No, we're brothers. I'm kidding. <laughs> you weren't going to claim you, Jason. Did y'all have a? Well, it's okay. We're related, just not at the racetrack. I got. You, the, I got. Who's you. the tougher one? Um. Huh. Uh, Mental, mentally, man, probably mentally me. Physically, physically, probably who, who's yeah. the one that took the worst butt kicking growing up from the other one? I, I know you had to fight me. Shoot, me and my sisters fight. Oh, between me and him, uh, he uh, see he's about six foot six, and I'm about five foot eleven. So, so you're the you main know, he's one. A, he's the towering giant, so I can just sneak around behind him. So it was. 
We really never did have no fights, honestly, much. Uh, no knockdown dragouts between families. No, because, well, there's there's 11 years between us. So uh, when I was big enough to fight, if he hit me, he could, he could go to jail. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to flog my brother's head. I ain't going to lie to nobody. I used to, I used to, I used to flog him. Well, all right, Ryan, it, you uh, you won an event at the famed High Banks at Volunteer Motor Speedway there in Bulls Cat. Tell me about that experience there, because that racetrack I went to for the first time this year, that place is awesome. It uh, it it, it really is. We um, we actually went uh, back up there last uh, I believe it was last March, and we was going. There was nothing going on around locally here, so we was going in preparation for the fast track tour race about a month later. And I had uh, never I'd been there and watched races, but I'd never run there before. And uh, you know, that was I'd been I'd been to some high bank tracks and stuff, but I'd never been to such a high bank track that was so short. But anyway, we um, with the help of uh, Shannon Buckingham, who's a, who's a real good personal friend of mine, I called him and I said, "Look, I'm." I'm coming up here in your back door. I said, you know, tell me what I need to do. And, you know, he told me. Well, then, so, you know, we go to the track and, and unload and hot lapped, and we was okay, and I didn't change nothing on the car, and we went out, and we was fortunate. We, uh, we set fast time, and, and Shannon was there, and he come up, and I said, you know, what do I need to do for the feature? And he said, just drive. Don't touch a thing. And I looked at him kind of crazy, and I thought, but we uh, was fortunate. We was running second there for a while, and the leader had trouble, and, and you know, for the last... Uh, for the last half of the race, we had the lead and and was able to win. And it's a, it is a a, a very interesting place. Uh, when you run through one and two, the first time you're ever there, it's kind of weird because if you run it just right and you can see, it's um, you know, a lot of tracks you can see the outside wall. Well, if you run in there and turn, if you are not, you can you don't see it. <laughs> it's so far up above you, you don't see the wall. Good. And it's, now, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Explain the difference, I mean, for people, I mean, most people here in, in my part of the country have been up there, but the difference between MODOC and Volunteer, I mean, night and day don't even describe it. Yes, um, you know, MODOC is, is is probably, it might be just a touch longer. It may not be. It may. I think it may be a touch longer straightaways, but um, I would guess that MODOC had 12 degrees of banking maybe. <laughs> In. Maybe, and this this place has uh, thirty. It's um, I mean it's it's there's only one other track on dirt that comes close to this place that I know of, and that's Tasman. And um, it's it is a it is a it is a dirt version of Bristol versus like Charlotte being a mile and a half track to our half mile dirt tracks. You know this is a small three H track that um, that is banked so much, and, and it's and it's pretty wide. I mean. You would honestly be surprised the, when we was up there for Grand Nationals. When we started out hot lapping, we was up a top, up at the top against the fence. And then when I come in, I decided to go to the bottom, and I had to change gears about 20 points in teeth. <laughs> um, just because it's, it's wide and it's so much shorter, and you don't carry so much more momentum versus you do off the top. And it it really is a different animal to go to. But if anybody ever dirt races, that kind of experience at that place is, is one of a kind. It's well worth it. That the, the the just what I'd heard so many great stories about. Well, both tracks, Tazewell and the Volunteer, um, and really you don't get uh, even as a spectator, you really don't uh, get the full unless you're there. And when I got there, it was just. Uh, I mean, you were literally. I tried to walk down uh, where the cars come on. I was going to go into the infield and get some video. And uh, I took one step, and I thought, I'll never make it down this thing. Um, so growing up in, in the Atkins family, obviously you guys have uh, been around racing uh, just about the, your whole life. Um, what's it been like growing up amongst such race enthusiasts? Well, um, you know, my dad has, uh, has been a, a team owner or, or a car owner since uh, 94, and I was born in 86, so... Really, as long as I can remember, I've been in racing, and honestly, it's a, it's a way of life. Um, you know, you don't, you know, a lot of people, you know, you hear them say, well, racing's a hobby. I mean, it's it's almost, a, you'd be surprised, um, besides uh, besides uh, my dad being a minister and going, and going to church, 
dirt racing comes in about second. I mean, we, we church comes first, and then you know our family and everything. But our family and racing is, is together, so that pretty much uh, that comes that comes right in. And uh, you know, it's from about March till about October. It's uh, you know, it's not well. Do you want to go play golf this weekend, or do you want to go to the beach? It's uh, it's which race which race we're going to this weekend? Which race we're going to go run at? And you know now. Myself being the driver, I I realize that I spend more time uh, even in the off season, like you know, this the stuff going on and going to the trade shows and and trying to and trying to meet the right people to uh, to, to to better your team and, and to get to get the best product you feel like you can for your car and you know it, it really does just become a, a way of life. All right. Now this fast track. Are you uh, strictly a crate uh, racer, pro dirt lake mile racer? Or do you do you dabble in supers or uh, any anything else? Well, I, I'd love to, but uh, my dad keeps the reins pulled back on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we actually still have a, a super motor, but uh, for some reason I can't I can't talk him into going and getting it. I I don't know. He uh, he probably he must know my driving better than I do. He's keeping me pulled back there, but. But no, I mean honestly, for where for where we're located, and for the money it takes to run a supercar, which we know because up until the last five five years, that's all we'd ever run, and for and for what they pay out um, at, at, at the tracks locally here and, and around at, the, at their touring events, compared to the to the crate car and what it costs to run a crate car and the touring events. It's economically, but I mean, it's just economically better as far as versus dollars spent versus dollars back in return. And I mean, if you based it just off of what it costs you to race versus what you can win, honestly, I feel like percentage wise, it's better because I'd say within three hours of, of our house, we can run probably fifteen to eighteen races a year, if not more. That'll pay anywhere from two thousand to five thousand to win, and you know there's a lot. Of, most of the super races that travel around is just a three or four thousand to win. Now there's the occasional ten thousand to win here and ten thousand to win there, but you know the the and and the type of money it is, it's just it's financially. I feel like it's financially better and smarter if if you have any kind of budget at all, which we definitely do. So. I really don't. I really don't foresee me and 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 my dad and that and mom and our family going into the super racing again, unless we hit the lottery and we don't play the lottery. So <laughs> I doubt it's going to happen. It's just. It's, do you think that the uh, like the weight breaks that they give to the crate cars so that the super guys will come and race with you guys or you know um, any of the tire advantages? I, I know that uh, like uh, C J Rayburn had that. Um, I can't even remember the the Nazareth series, and mm-hmm. you know he gave the crate guys, the steel block guys, a weight break, the, the crate engine guys a weight break. Everybody ran on that hard right rear tire. Do you think that's that's kind of a, a more of a way to get everybody back to one class of car? Um, well, it's you know they're trying to to put an equalizer out there. The only thing is. I've watched um, even some some races at, at local, like if there's a local track not far from me that's a that's a, a really small track, and um, they didn't put a they didn't put a harder tire into in, into play, but they put like the steel head steel block motors at 2,400 pounds, and they put the supers at 2,500, and they put the crate guys at, at 22 or 2,250, and there's a crate racer there, uh, a guy that I watched that night, and he runs in the top three, and top, you know, and he's won a lot of races there at that place. Well, when those guys come in and and run and and run against it, he could he couldn't crack the top five, and it's just the tire may make a big difference, but weight versus horsepower ratio is is it, it takes a really big margin. I mean, in all honesty, there probably isn't a fair weight ratio just between the six hundred four and six hundred two. And it's a, it's 150 pounds, and right. that's only supposedly a 50 pound. I mean, a 50 horsepower difference. Yeah, but so that just, 602 motor's got to carry them steel heads on the front of the car too. That's exactly right. They do, and that, and that, and that's just another that's just another hindrance to it because you're saying, well, you guys can be lighter. Well, then they're sitting here and having to tote this boat anchor in the front of their car, and it just it makes it so tough on them. So how? I mean, 
But what about like the the series like um, the Steel Block Mafia guys run, where the 604 crate motor pretty much has dominated the whole series over the supers? Um, well, I, I'm not exactly sure where that's located, but now I do know for a fact, and I even and I even seen this happen um, probably three years ago at the Ice Bowl. I went down there and, and watched it, and um, the uh, the guy that said, you know, they had crates and supers, and, you know, they have everything there. Well, the guy that sat on the pole in the crate race turned a faster time than the guy in the suit, the, the guy that sat on the pole in the supers. And, you know, I think if you get to the right tracks, it definitely, because, I mean, Ronnie Johnson took that little, I call it like a mid-motor, like that 525 motor, mm-hmm. and, um, and he run a lot of those tracks down south and smaller and really, really, really slicks off. And, and, and smoked he, he them. them. It yeah, sure did. Well, all right, guys, I got to I gotta move the show along. We lost Webb. The we crate? Web, I think. Oh. Oh, there he comes. The there cr- he is. Are we back? Yeah, you're, you're yeah, there. Now. Okay, yeah, well, this- you got to let Ryan announce his, his new sponsors for this year, too. I know that's, he wanted to get that plug in. That's right. Ryan, the floor is yours to thank your sponsors and anything coming up in 2012. Okay, well, thank, well, I definitely have to thank my mom and dad. They're my team owner and, and of course, my biggest supporter. Um, Hicks Water Stove has been with us ever since we started. Uh, W&B Fabrica- uh, Fabricators. Uh, Heinz Brothers Performance, Steve Heights, uh, super guy, been great to us. Um, FK Rod Ends, Maria there, has uh, built us a, a killer product. I couldn't think of a better product to run. Um, for Gola Performance Systems, um, of course, uh, and I, I am... Uh, making the switch and, and looking forward to running uh, JRI shocks this year. I believe they'll be really, really beneficial to us in our program, so I'm really, really looking forward to that. That's probably our biggest change for the year. Um, Hendron Race Engines, he builds me a, a, a killer motor that I, I couldn't, you know, couldn't do without. Um, you know, um, I just, I really I appreciate and thank everybody in FARS for, for what we have going on next year. It, it's honestly hard to say because no schedule's been put been put out, but I'd say we'll be going from anywhere around from tour race to tour race and, and running some local shows and just uh, we're gonna go race and have a big time and maybe win us a few. Well, that's that's Ryan Atkins out of Mount Airy, North Carolina. We certainly just wish you luck. We we'll be in touch with you over the next year or so as we're working with Jason uh, with FlyToFly.net and bring his drivers on. When we come back from the break, Mr. Andrew Wiley has been holding for. Uh, quite a while we've uh, kind of let time slip away we're also we're going to start taking calls after andrew wiley for the uh, pay-per-view event that we're giving away on behalf of michael riggs being dirt on dirt so y'all just stay tuned sit back and we're uh, we're going to go into overtime here on in the dirt all right race fans we're back from break in the dirt another uh, break another break well you got to take a couple breaks guy got a screen to calls if i had if I had a guy sitting here, you know, doing all the producing, I it wouldn't be so bad. But hey, we got a winner yet? We haven't had the calls yet. I want to do this last interview with Mister Wiley. Andrew, you with us? I'm here, man. How y'all doing? Oh, just recovering from. I ate so much this past uh, three days; it's uh, ridiculous. Uh, well, hope you had a good Christmas. Hope you did too. So, Andrew, you, you you've uh, made your way from uh, Pennsylvania to charlotte um explain the move and what brought it about um actually uh i'm back in pennsylvania now when i i went to school college uh at unc charlotte for mechanical engineering i did my my undergraduate and graduate there and then i um worked for nascar team as, for, as an engineer and then uh I don't know, NASCAR is a whole different animal, and I decided to move back to Pennsylvania and start my own um, fabrication business. Not exactly what I went to school for, but it was always a passion I had and kind of used my my degree to make my business unique, and, you know, that's kind of what I've been doing now. But I was in Charlotte for, for six years for school and work. Yeah, that's a fun time, especially when you want to be driving, ain't it? That's right. Yeah, I did a lot of traveling, um, actually back and forth, because our our team was still based in in Pennsylvania that entire time. So I definitely racked up the sky miles. 
Yeah, that's that's what I tell tell guys. If you wanna you wanna go down there and you wanna work, there's always uh, jobs down there. There's teams looking for guys to come and work. But just keep in mind, 342 of that 365 days a year, you're about gonna spend on the road. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah, my actually my position, I was a uh, research and development engineer, and it, you know, at, at, with that position, you kind of stay in the shop, but. Um, a lot of the guys associated with the teams, you know, they basically live out of a suitcase in a hotel room. And, um, you know, it's recently here I've had some opportunities to be a race engineer for some nationwide team. And, you know, I just think it's, uh, you know, it's not for everybody. There's a, NASCAR is a lot of politics, and um, my background is actually pavement. And, uh, you know, even if you go back to the local level, um Politics are huge with pavement racing as well. Uh huh. So now you're back in in Pennsylvania, or uh, in your race, you're, you're racing dirt. Yeah. Are you are you following a series up there? That's amazing. Yeah, there, yeah. whip is that these guys that we see these guys are moving from asphalt to dirt. What about that? <laughs> it, it's got to yeah. be the, the most growing uh, part of the is, sport. Is it something in the water or is it something in the air? Am I wrong or? Uh, is this the future? Uh, you're right. It definitely is the future. I mean, uh, you know, growing up, I, I kind of realized that I, I have great sponsors, but I don't have um, millions of dollars to spend each year to, to make it to the top level. I mean, there's no, there's, I mean, I hate to say it, no matter what your talent is, there's no other way unless you got lots of money. And, um, you know, asphalt's a, a, a great experience. You, you learn so much. I mean, not not that you don't on dirt, but it's just a totally different experience. And, uh, you know, I think uh, if I had to compare the two, um, dirt racing's where it's at. Asphalt's for getting there, you know. That's kind of what I tell people. Well, that's, but, uh, that's, what I've, that's what I've always told everybody. Asphalt's for getting to the racetrack. Yeah, and yeah, they'll tell you dirt's for farming. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, t- well, tell us then, since, since you did spend the time there, do the do the asphalt NASCAR guys concern themselves at all with the uh, with the dirt tracks? Because part of what I don't like is people kind of turn their nose up to what we do, uh, whether we follow dirt track as a media person or working within the industry. But do the NASCAR guys even know we're here? Yeah, I think that um, I think that was true. You know, that was true five years ago even, but here in the last year or two, you know, um, you, you know, you even got like, uh, you got companies such as the, the Longhorn Chassis and, you know, they're, they're using some technology that, that, um, not to bash any, um, you know, reputable dirt chassis builders, but they use technology that, uh, that they, that would just make them look cross-eyed. So, I think I think that um, NASCAR, especially uh, even even with engines, you got Roush Yates, you got ECR, and uh, you know you got engine programs moving over to dirt, and you got um, you know that aspect coming from from NASCAR to dirt. But uh, yeah, I think I think the the Tony Stewart has been a big part of that. Um, you know, introducing dirt racing to the to the drivers that weren't familiar with it, and then, uh, you know, I think that give it a couple more years and, you, it, you know, it'll be more and more. See, that's that's one thing that, that there are some people out there that are concerned about that, that the future of dirt on a local level, or the future of short track racing, period, is a, a concern for people because they feel that, especially in the late model side of things, that the uh, dirt late models are heading kind of the route that, you know, the NASCAR uh, Winston Cup stuff did back in the uh, early 80s. Right, yeah, I, I was actually listening to you guys a little bit earlier here. I'm working on the computer, and uh, you were talking about the, the late, no, late model divisions, and um, that's why crate racing is such a necessity, you know, that um, it makes it affordable. I mean, it you, you got... Racing a, a crate late model involves technology. You know, it, it involves real shock. It involves um, what what I would consider technology. You know, racing lower levels, 
not to bash them, but racing a pro stock or street stock or whatever, you know, lower level um, racing is a different kind of technology. And, uh, you know, I think to keep, I think to keep the businesses associated with racing and keep local racing growing, you know, crate racing is a necessity. And, um, as far as the technology goes, you know, with street stocks and that kind of thing, the same technology, you know, can be applied. I think the important thing at that level is that it's not applied. I don't think I want to see Jason Owens building building shocks for, uh, you know, my buddy's 78 Monte Carlo that he goes and races, you know, against guys that have a 1000 bucks on a car. And right, yeah, I, that, I understand what you're saying, but, I mean, um, you know, it, it really can't be applied um, to when it to certain rule packages, and uh, you know the same goes for a late model. The same goes for a sprint car. I mean, you've got rules that you got to work within, and that you know that's another great thing about straight racing versus an open open uh, super late model. You know, fast track does. In fact, it's frustrating. They do such a good job policing um, their rule book and. You know, it's that that that's what keeps the level playing field, and that's what you know. You can argue with with me by saying it keeps it affordable, but in a sense, it really does. Um, you know, so I I really think that uh, I I think that the tracks are trying to implement the crate motors in with their limited class and trying to move the um, you know the steel block limited open motors out. And basically replace them with the with the crate series such as Fast Track and the NDRA down south, um, just because it's not you know for for a local for a local team, it's it's pretty you know it's not feasible to to run supers. I mean, there's nothing I'd like to do more this year than move up, but that's because I have a big ego, and that's really the uh, <laughs> probably the only reason. You know, I mean, it just it just doesn't make it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Are you running the uh, fast track northeast up there with uh, Miss Vicky and the bunch? Yeah, yes, I am. That's that's pretty much what um, what our schedule our schedule is, and uh, they, they usually have about twenty two to twenty four races, and then you know we had another twenty five or so of uh, local shows in in the mix of it. Now, so. With with your opinion being said about the crates, is I I, th- I just think that uh, the the fans and even some of the older school drivers, when they hear crates, it's just a, it's something negative that comes along with it, I guess. It well, it kind of turns them off because Webb they want to go to a racetrack and they want to hear cars ripping ass around there. That's right. You know what that's I mean? right. That's, that's what they want to come to hear. They want to feel them shake the ground. They don't want to uh, come there and listen to Johnny's. Uh, 87 uh, station wagon motor whine around there at, you know, 6,500 RPM. I totally get that. I totally get the, uh, uh, you want to have the fastest and the biggest and the best out there. I get that, and that's from a fan. Uh, But I got to go along with what Andrew says and say that if we want to have local racing, that the crate, the crate's going to be it because you got to yeah. make it. I think you've got to also make it open, and you got to make people feel like they can come and compete at the same time. Because there's guys out there that can build engines that can compete. They they can come and do it, but it's gotten to the point where they feel like they can't. They feel like they have to have that Roush oh, engine yeah. I mean, to come out there yeah. and compete. Yeah, I, I disagree. You know, being around um, the technology associated with NASCAR, you know. It, it, there's, there's. You tell no me the last time you seen 850 horsepower go to the ground in a dirt light model. Um, Charlotte. <laughs> I mean, but, but uh, most people don't no race at Charlotte. The race they the race year, at tracks know, and, like Moeller. They race at Brownstown. They they race at at these little bull ring tracks like down in uh, Burnside, Kentucky, at Lake Cumberland okay. Motor Speedway. They they race at tracks like that. They're not running on right, tracks yeah. like Eldora every single weekend. There is no right. way a, a crate motor not. will I, compete at Eldora. I definitely Eldora. don't claim to be any kind of engine guy, you know, but what what I am aware of is, you know, if you can build a, a an engine that is 
driver friendly whenever you do have that much power and um you know give the driver more of an opportunity to to use it um you know that then it then it's going to be what, beneficial what I want to see is I want to see Scott Bloomquist go to Muller Raceway Park and run against Fast Freddy Carpenter <laughs> I want to see him run against Barry Dawes. It's, I think it's. Just I don't cost, think. I cost. don't. I don't. I don't think it's going to be one of those big, devastating defeats. I, I don't. I don't see those guys coming there and walking all over some of these local guys at, at some of these small bull rings, running at Knoxville, running at Charlotte, places like that where you know the horsepower is an advantage. Yeah, I, I mean, it's going to happen, but it's just the the same way. I was. I was in. I was in the NASCAR thing too, and I know what it turned into. Right, and they, yeah, no, and they uh, drove they drove guys out. Right, yeah, they do, and I, there, there's no doubt. You know, I don't think I don't think open late model racing is really going anywhere to, at the local short tracks. I'm just kind of speaking from the theory standpoint. You know, um, you know, even if you take like here in the Northeast, the UFO is a large series. I mean, you, the, you they're a have, great series too. That's right, a, that's right. the other thing about them. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they tried to implement the 525 crate with a different spoiler, but, you know, I'll be honest, it's, it's, it's a hindrance. Same as, um, you know, I, I don't know. I got mixed opinions. I just, uh, I think the future the future of, I agree. There's no, You know, there's nothing I like seeing. Why don't, more instead of, of worrying power. about engines, won't we get rid of these uh, $7,500 shock packages? <laughs> yeah, no what doubt. What about, you know, Keeping the, I know you're not going to keep guys out of. There's guys out there wind tunnel test, and I, I. That's that's where that's where all this stuff is going to. Why why aren't we looking into the real important aspects of of the sport? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, with pavement racing, on I ran ASA for quite a while, and you know they implemented a three hundred and fifty dollar shock rule. Well, that was the most expensive rule they could ever implement. I mean, you know there was guys hiring Penske to come to the racetrack and the the Penske truck and help and test and you know I, I agree with what you're saying it's uh you know that's part of racing though <laughs> you know, you'll never get around it so no but they can stop they can stop making it so easy to you know to move it in that direction right right yeah that's uh well, Andrew, a part of the part of the reason why we brought you on the show this evening is is the work that uh, you do with uh, Jason Atkins and Flag to Flag dot net. So, what I'd like to give you now is the opportunity to thank all your sponsors or some of your customers or uh, with your manufacturing and fabrication. Uh, but the floor is yours. The next thirty seconds, go. Okay, yeah, I definitely want to thank Jason. I'm just trying to uh, you know help expand his new new product up here in the Northeast. But uh, we we do have a great list of sponsors that help us out, both, um, you know, product sponsors and, and um, people that help our business out. But the, our largest one is 84 Lumber. Um, we have 84 Lumber that help us, McDonald's, Rimrock Design out of Florida, um, Wall Covering Specialist, ACA Engineering. Um, our CPA helps us out. Um, on the product sponsor side, i got Red Devil Brakes, um, Maria at SK Rod Ends, um, ASI Racewear, Brown and Miller Racing Solutions in Charlotte. You know, there there's so many people that are willing to support uh, support it, support our team that um, we're extremely lucky. And I first, or I gotta thank my parents as well because they uh, they definitely are our biggest fans. Well, Andrew, we certainly appreciate you coming on, and I hope that I can call upon you again when the season gets going. You can uh, kind of give us the the lowdown about the Northeast and what's going on up there this uh, coming season. Will do. Thank you again. All right, Andrew Wiley out of Pennsylvania. I'd like to thank him for coming on board this evening and talking to us about, well, the crate has seems to be the uh, theme it's of always, the evening. It's, it's always the big crate debate. But I'll tell you what, there's a good thing on uh, the DRC.net. Did you see the six days of Swami? Yes, that was great, by the way. John Mr. Weber... Jersey. You know, he he let those he let us come in and and videotape him, and he told us some of his stories. and And that guy's been around racing for years and years and years, and not just around racing in general, but he's been a, around the winning side. You know, some of the best teams to ever come out of dirt late model racing. Period. So, um, you know, that guy's got real good uh, 
you know, he's got a lot of good history behind him, and I think uh, it's it's pretty interesting segments they got on the DRC.net. Everybody should check out the Six Days of Swami. Uh, my favorite story of the whole sh- the whole shebang was the uh, car finishing in the air to win the race. Oh, yeah, when Audi comes across the line with the car up on the fence, and you could see the whole bottom of the car going down the front stretch. That's what I'm talking I, about. That'd be a whole. That'd be a heck of a, a finish to beat anywhere. Anywhere, any any genre. All right, race fans, we're going to take another short break, and when we come back, we will have the call in to see who wins the first night of the pay per view from an Arizona compliment to Michael Rigsby and Dirt on Dirt. So right after, as soon as the break's over, start calling because the tenth caller will win the one night. Be right back. Well, we're back from our final break. Jason final Axel. break. Jack, Jason Atkins still with us. Of course, Mr. Brian Gray. Jason, the, the crate debate took over once again. Yeah, it did. It seems to be a developing trend here on uh, <laughs> in the dirt slash flag to flag. We are debate. for the future of the sport. You know, what, you, can't, you can't move forward without having conversation. That's, that's the whole thing. Absolutely, and I'm not going to I'm not going to throw my two cents worth and, and disagree. The only thing I would I would say to to some of our guys' points and is this: when it's it's one of the things that, that that got lost in the conversation is not only is it affordable for the racer, but it is affordable for the track promoter on a weekly night. That's right. And when you when you can do that that right because stuff, they get to pay a less amount of a person. Sure. Five, six, yeah. seven hundred dollars to win. That that makes it affordable. And, and I think, I think, in my personal opinion, if we can keep that affordable, then we can continue to expose new clientele and new new fan bases to our sport, uh, which will kind of link them to the super late model racing. Listen, and Jason, brother, I get the affordability yeah. part about it, but at sure. the same time, I mean, I don't know about track promoters down in the south i'm not down there and i don't know how many cars or how many fans are rolling through the grandstand and through the pay gates each night sure um but like i said before if you watch the little segment on the drc.net with john weber he used to own florence speedway florence speedway is a pretty significant track as far as dirt late model racing goes i mean they hold the I North South 100 there oh, uh, I, hall of fame's there. It, I mean yeah the dirt late model hall of fame is there so I mean I, I respect and, and I believe when when I hear something you know hear things from those guys that for the most part they the uh, track owners are paying their purse from the gate and I know that there's other expenses involved but there's I just think that the promoters want to they want to shrink things down and, and everybody wants more for less work that's just what I believe it, it boils down to, and that's, that's now, my, my uh, own opinion. Okay, and, and I will say, I tried to get, uh, now people, like we talked to Mr. Mooneyham earlier, and, I, and he said he was a promoter. Mm-hmm. The thing that I think gets lost, too, is there's got to be a formula of this. If you don't have people in the stands, there's, there, then there's no reason for a, a, an advertiser to come on board. Um, so we got to find a happy medium between fans to show and drivers to uh, track promoters, and then the circle completes itself, tr- uh, track owner to fans. Um, I, I think I it's really all a matter of getting the right people in the right locations, too. That, that might be. But the thing is, we've got to figure out a way to, to bring quality to the speedway, right? And quality mm-hmm. involves facility. Quality involves show. Quality involves uh, uh, kind of understanding what each other's part is in the equation because uh, quality is entertainment value that's right for your dollar spent that's right and i don't think that i don't i think some of these track owners race car drivers are never going to make the money back they put into a race team it's just it's just a black hole um they want to race they need the money to race then they need to they need to broaden their horizons and be able to do more for a sponsor than just put their name on the car. They got to be able to talk for their sponsor, do a video here and there for their sponsor, get involved with people like Jason Atkins, uh, get be out there, be seen. This in turn, well, the selling part of that also, Web, you know, doesn't all happen at the racetrack. I mean, we're not there at right. the racetrack. Right. You, you, your, your, your part as a driver, as the guy that is um, representing a company that you've put on your car. 
is not just on that Friday or Saturday night. You know, it goes. It has to go beyond that. It does. And that's, that's exactly right. Well, if you don't go beyond that, it will not go that far beyond you. No. Right. That's right. And, and I, I, my, I think what my point being is I don't think that the track owners are in love with racing as they were 30 years ago. Um, and I don't think that the the drivers are as in love with racing, say, on the on the like my father was and my grandfather or 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 your your older family Brian or, or your father Jason. It was definitely different. Different, yes, different, it was very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, now it's a, we live we live in a, a gimme gimme society. That's just all it's about. And I don't I don't think there's going to be a way to pay what do do racers deserve more money for some some of the shows I've seen certainly. Um, but you got to weigh that against the butts in the seat. You got to weigh that against uh, lights, pay the light bill, pay the insurance for the track, pay the cheeseburger maker, pay the ticket taker. I mean, there's lots of stuff, lots of money going in different directions just to have a show. But the uh, opportunity, the opportunity is there, and I just see so many racetracks not seize their there, potential. You're, you're right, you're right there, and we can all, without naming one, but we all could, we could all name racetracks who who don't get it. Um, and the the problem is, is that it's most of them, and then you know, the, then the majority of people were coming back. Well, what's wrong with local racing? What's wrong with local racing? You, you go to the racetrack, and there's nothing there but a seat. That's right. And a now, line fifty people long at intermission at intermission to get a cheeseburger. Now, now I'll have to give some tracks to hear credit, and I will like places like uh, Columbus. Mm-hmm. They they do it right. Columbus, uh, Mississippi, places like the uh, the Mag over in Mississippi do it right. Yeah, uh, there's a and there's a and like I said, there's a lot of tracks that that do get it that do get it right. And if you look at their attendance, they're probably the ones that are that are doing pretty good. Yeah, and if you don't have people in the stands, people want to go to a place that people want to be at. So if they show up somewhere and, and there's you know. All these grandstands and and they're completely empty with you know four or five people scattered out here and there. That gives you no incentive to want to come back there. That's right. So well, they want right. to they want to be where the people want to be. That's right. Well, th- this debate rages not only here but on the in the forums. Um, I'm sure amongst people who go to the races, we uh, we all have this conversation every now and again. It just seems like nobody wants to do anything about it. That's what gets me worked up. Well, I mean, I'm I'm with you, and I, I I'm sure Jason's been to some speedways where he's just like, you know, this is a, this isn't good. I mean, not to speak for you, Jason, but let's uh let's give away this uh, one night of the pay per view uh, from Arizona. Um, starting right now, call in the show at six four six two hundred zero five five eight, and the tenth caller will receive the one night pay per view courtesy of. Dirt on Dirt and Michael Rigsby. So the number again is 646-200-0558. And now we wait. And now we wait for the phone to ring. And we, and when you pick it up, you got to say, Sir, number one. one. Yeah. I just got rid of caller one. You just got rid of one? I got rid of caller one. All right. Just got rid All of caller one. Right, let's wait till about seven. And me and you, you and I can hang up on web and just start dialing. Just dumped, you just dumped caller number two. I just dumped caller number three. Thanks for calling, by the way. Just dumped caller number four. All right. So who's all calling in? I don't know. I'm just dumping them. I'm not trying to get to ten. Or grab grab a, grab one of them and say, hey, you just did not win. Like, say it all happy. <laughs> I don't think we need to hang up and start calling ourselves. No. Six, oh. six, 200. All right. Six four six two hundred zero five five eight. Am I allowed to call in? I can't call. No, you're, in. Not, you're not able to call I can't in. Can't go on it. I'm looking for a cell phone. Seven. I'm going to try to. I can. I, I'm not allowed eight, to win, right? Nine. And caller number ten. How? What is your name and where are you calling from? Hello, caller. Hello, Webb. Uh, this is uh, Webb Dillard in the Dirt. You are caller 10. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Is this Webb? Yeah, it's Webb. Okay, this is Bud Fultz. Say that again? Oh, it's Bud Fultz. 
<laughs> How you doing, bud? Okay. I, I figured if I win this darn thing, I'm too far away, but I would like to uh, dedicate it to uh, Arlene Pippen. Oh, that's very classy move. Good. All right. Uh, well, you're not too she- far away. You can you too- can view Dirt on Dirt anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I know that, but being that I'm related to you, I, I don't think I'll accept it. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. I, was say, I didn't know if it would be. I'm your, I, I'm, I'm your grandfather's brother. And well, I, I appreciate calling in, but I would I would like to award it to the next caller if, if you wouldn't mind, bud. I don't want to be. I don't want to be accused. That, of, uh, that is that. perfectly. That's perfectly okay. Th- thanks for for taking the call. All right, uh, Bud Fold's my great uncle. How about that? That's pretty cool, uh, but we still have. So we're going to give this thing away. Uh, keep calling, keep calling. One more call. Next, Somebody next next person to call in gets the. Uh, what do they get? We get the uh, first night of the uh, of the pay per view. Wild West shootout. The Wild West shootout. The yeah. Wild West shootout. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it, and that's going to be uh, broadcast live on Dirt on Dirt. That is correct, uh, straight out of Arizona. I believe it's Tucson, if I'm correct. I'm not 100% sure on that. Now, is this just, they just run that out. That's just one of their tracks uh, events, right? Yes, but they're having the uh, uh, a uh, special event for the super late models. So this will be like World Outlaws or Lucas Oil guys? It, it's kind of like a Speed Weeks or Winter Nationals, except it's in Arizona. And they'll have it here. I think it's the third week of January, and they race four or five nights out there. And then this coverage, I'm assuming, is, is for the first night. But there'll be no provisional starting spots, right? Um, ooh, I'm not 100 percent sure. Depend on who sanctions that, because a lot of times they'll carry it over for the first few events. Well, let's have that debate. What about provision? Because see, I think that provisional starting spots are what started the destruction of NASCAR. We're still looking for that tenth caller to, uh, to give it away. We didn't award it to Bud Fultz, uh, although he was the tenth caller. We're, we're going to still award this thing. So next caller wins the uh, pay per view. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to make no, sure. Is that a bad surprised. conversation to have, Webb? What's that? Because I know I've I've heard the pros and cons about this guy follows the series all year. Well, you know what? I don't care about that guy following the series all year. I want to see the guy that raced his way into the event. I don't want to see some guy get given a spot or two or three or four spots just because they follow the series around. I want to see the guy that earned it. You talking about the provisionals in the um, sanction? In any in anything? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, you got I guess you could. Past champions, I would say. I would past say. champions that they were past champions. That's true, but I mean, it's just right. like what about the new champion? What about that local guy that's been racing his so, butt off all night see. or all weekend to get into that race and misses out on that one spot because you know this guy follows the series and runs on the tail and gets in. This is this is a very popular debate. And my brother, in his first couple of years of tour racing, went through this, and I will offer you, offer you this uh, this proposition. In order to accommodate both, to try to give you the best of both worlds, have your 24-car starting field. The 25th position can be added if the promoter agrees, only if the top qualifier or the top point getter doesn't make it, but it, is, it cannot affect the top 24 spots, which is the standard starting number of positions for a race. Would that be right? Now, see, I, I like that. But it, I also think that they don't start enough cars in a race either. Well, you don't I think, think 20, I think 24 cars at Eldora is ridiculous. I think there needs to be 30. Well, I mean, that's that's up to... I, now, it, Jason, you, you may know this. <laughs> Jason, you may be able to answer this. I've always been on the impression that why there's 43 cars... In NASCAR is it's something to do with AAA way back in the day. So that's how many cars could be on a certain amount of highway together at one time to be safe. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Just something I heard in the past. I, I've heard that. I don't know anything that's tied to it. A good friend of mine, uh, he came home and uh, he's very close with our family. He is actually uh, a distinguished crew member on the the Wood Brothers Twenty One car, and and that, that's a question I would really like to pose to him, but. If you look at the vast majority of their tracks, you remove Martinsville, Bristol, and a couple others, 
they're one mile and up or three quarters of a mile and up. So there needs to be more than forty three cars. Sir? You could accommodate more than forty three, but I don't even know if they have that many teams that even field that could even field cars that have more than what they have. I think the average number of, of, of attempted qualifiers for this past year somewhere on, on the on the Sprint Cup side is around the forty seven or forty eight range. I know for Daytona it gets up into the fifties and, and some other select high profile events. And then, you know, some of the others in the mid to upper forties. Uh, as far as you know, teams attempting to make you know the starting grid. What? Well, let's. I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit. While I can't believe I had exactly ten calls, and the tenth call was my great uncle ineligible for the uh, prize. But let's switch gears. This pay per view pay per view stuff that um, Dirt on Dirt's uh, done uh, twice now from uh, Cedar Lake. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, uh, uh, other people have done it. Uh, other entities have done it. Uh, here. Here we come on. We're on the uh, verge of having another one there in our Arizona. That's uh, I believe that's a good, that's going to be uh, more and more uh, from the internet and the ability to broadcast. Do you guys think, like the idea? Don't like the idea? Does it hurt or help racing? Me, me personally, I like the idea, um, and I also like the idea of the fact that when they do it. Uh, just like at Cedar Lakes, it is blacked out within a certain area, and I hate it for some, for some of those for some of those viewers that maybe cannot make the event. But then again, to a certain extent, it's kind of like being the president. You can't satisfy every single debt budget ratio at the same time. So I feel like you know when the World Finals comes to Charlotte, if they were to do it there, I wouldn't have a problem with it being blacked out in a certain area, only because it's really intended. To number one, you know, expand the coverage, and number two, to get into areas, to, you know, to to new clientele. So, well, it's really I think to to stop that guy that lives right down the street from not going to the race. He can sit at home and watch it there at home rather than than to go in and you know sure. buy a ticket and watch the race. Because really, the the ultimate goal is to have butts in the stands. Because even I know we're all about racing, but it's it's a heck of a a lot funner to go out there and race in front of a full crowd versus, you know, a few people. I totally agree, and that's why I don't have an issue. You know, some some people get a little, get their feathers ruffled a little bit, but I don't have an issue with it being blacked out for a one- to two-hour radius from the location of the event. But, for example, when they go to Arizona, I will have the package. There's no way I could go to Arizona. There's no way that Webb and I, I mean, could, could take off from the multi-million-dollar jobs that we have <laughs> and take, take off to Arizona and take a week off to go do that deal. No, all yeah. just aside, seriously, we couldn't do that. So I think that aspect of it's great. To find something that fits perfect kind of goes back to the, the the late model deal. To find the perfect thing that fits everyone, I don't know. I guess that's, uh, I hate to say this, this is cliche, but I guess that's why Baskin Robbins makes 31 flavors. It's all the same ice cream, it's just got a different flavor to who it appeals to and and I don't know. At, at the end of that day, at the end of the day, I, I feel like the gain of the exposure from what the live coverage does far outweighs the negative, the negative, or the cons of. Well, I can't get to the track at night. I could have watched it, but I'm blacked out. I don't know. That, that's just a personal opinion. It doesn't doesn't necessarily mean. Well, it's then right. you can you can go back and I guess watch the replay. I don't know if they blocked that out or not. But I've talked with I've talked with a, a number of people about doing the same thing. And and I think it can't do anything but good for the sport because just of the general exposure, being able to expose it to more people. I would agree because it's not commercialized. You know that. Yeah. So. Well, I, I hope that it's just something that we use, which, you know, Rigsby and those guys do a wonderful job uh, presenting racing in, in this format. Um, I hope they got more than one camera. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they They're going to have they more than when, one camera. When do we get to see those end cars, Webb? That's right. Pretty soon uh, the missus is, has uh, went out and ordered me a GoPro, so I'm going to be uh, wanting to put it on cars everywhere. What we're going to do is, is we we had exactly ten calls. Uh, the 10th caller, uh, my great-uncle Bud, uh, Bud Foltz from in- Indiana, uh, was ineligible to win, being related to the host. It's we will hold the prize until next week. Next week, we will be doing the Ice Bowl 
the 2012 Ice Bowl Preview Show. We will have Super Late Model Track Champion Jason Wilson. We'll have formal, 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 f- 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 formal. We'll I can't say it. We'll have former Ice Bowl Champion Randall Walker. We're going to have Dylan Krim, who finished second to Shane Clanton last year in last year's Ice Bowl. We're also going to have Mr. Eddie Davis, who is the announcer at Talladega Slope Track. We're going to have Tommy Tedder. He will be with Kel Carr. Kelly, Kelly Carson will also be with us. We're going to have a representative from the Cajun Mini Stock. Cajun Mini Stock will be making an appearance during the Ice Bowl. Next week's show is just packed full of people. We'll probably use the whole two hours. Uh, Jason and Atkins, thank you very much uh, for what you do with flagflag.net. Bringing your guys on. Once a month, appreciate you. Well, we appreciate you having us, and we encourage all the race teams to check us out at flagtheflag.net and to stay tuned for our newsletter and hopefully the announcement of a permanent radio show and a partnership with you guys moving forward. And we're just looking for the opportunity to gain the exposure they need and deserve to the companies they represent. Mr. Brian Gray, welcome back from your hiatus. Thank uh, you, sir. Well, we definitely stirred the pot tonight on the crate debate, for sure. Well, we're going to try to stir it every night. That's right. Um, I, hopefully, Brian, you're going to be with me uh, from here on out. You know, Maybe Chad will come on, get you revved back up. Bring maybe him I'll... on. <laughs> well, all right, for all my guests, thank you very much. For the listeners, thank you very much. Like I said, we did give away. Bring him on next week. That's right. Bring him on. Bring Chad on next week. I bet he won't come on. <laughs> so everybody, listen next week. To get your chance to win the first night of the pay per view live from Arizona, USA Raceway out there. And uh, for in the dirt, Brian Gray, this is Web Builder. We're out of here.